Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Controversial Issues. Today, we'll be discussing what is it about the Karaites? Karaites. Karaites. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, welcome back, Rabbi. How are you today? Doing great. Awesome. Always a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to have you here, for sure. No doubt. So, uh, so what? What? This has been coming up for for years, and we've never really. I, honestly, I don't even think I've talked about this one on any show before. This is this is probably the very first one in eight years. Well, going on eight years where this topic has actually been on the table. So there's a lot of things about it. I mean, I guess the aspect of what I want to cover is everything. Number one, in in whatever order seems fitting, of course. Number one is what is it that they do believe? I mean, or, or what is it that they don't believe? However, that works out. Where they came from? Uh, like like originally, some people say they from the Sadducee side of of things. I don't know if they went back that far. Were they even earlier than that when they originated? How did they become about what triggered why they went this way? It's kind of like this. I mean, um, you know, up until about 250 years ago, we all know that there was only Judaism. There was there was no reform. There was no conservative. It was just all Judaism up until about 250 years ago. So what triggered that movement? Somebody was like, oh, well, I don't like this. I'm going to do it my way. So I want to go into that aspect of it as well uh, and and some a, a few of the highlights as to some major things that they don't do that realistically, in the um, best way to put it, don't really make sense. So um, I'll just let you handle it in whatever order you want and just we'll keep as thorough as we can. We just want to see uh, what, what they're all about. So, And so with that, Rabbi, I'll turn it over to you and let you have it. Okay. Um, is it, you know, this, this topic obviously goes into the topic that we've done, you know, a few times, which maybe, you know, we'll revisit. And that is why I listen to the rabbis and oral law, which they pretty much, pretty much rejected. You know, one thing we'll just, you know, we'll just mention at the outset. And that is you go against the rabbis, fall, you fall by the wayside. That's just seemingly what happens. So even though we're going to say it's a relatively a new thing, so to speak, it's been around for a long time. Right, originates around the year 700 Common Era, or maybe a little bit later than that. And we even have earlier groups, you know, where they derive from. Now, we, you mentioned before, you know, about the, the Sadducees, as in Talmudic literature, they're called the Sadukim, or Sadducees, or the Baitusim, Baitusim, known as the, I don't know, Boethians, whatever you want to call it, how to pronounce it, which are mentioned in, in the Talmud, and they emerge around around the time of the Second Temple. Now, the claim is that they believe, so to speak, in, a, in the Jewish gods, and they believe in Torah. They've been considered, in many ways, part of what we're going to call mainstream observant Judaism, but they're heretical because they reject divine origin of oral law. Now, that's a mouthful right there. So we're going to explain, you know, you mentioned earlier, that, you know, up until 250 years ago, basically everybody was Orthodox. Some more, some less, et cetera. But you didn't have these, quote unquote, heretical movements, reform, conservative, et cetera. That's pretty much new invention. So everybody pretty much held according to Torah. You had splinter groups, right? Splinter groups meaning that they rejected Torah, et cetera. But the main idea over here is they reject divine origin of oral law. Now, why is that? They accept only the written form. In other words, they understand, they interpret the beliefs of the Torah from what? From verses alone, which is problematic. Because according to them, they're going to say, well, we don't have to listen to the rabbis. We'll see why that's not true. But they'll say, we don't have to listen to the rabbis. We have our own interpretation. We're only going to go according to what the Torah says. Now, I've heard many people say, what do I have to listen to you for? You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to listen to God. I only want to follow what the Torah says. Well, that's going to be problematic for a number of reasons. But over here, they're going to go according to what the verses alone say. And their name, you know, is based on this Hebrew term or Hebrew Aramaic term for a Torah verse, which is called Mikra, right? Mikra means Torah, right? A Torah verse or Kra, which is, I guess, a shortened, shortened form of the word. So therefore, you got Karaim, as they're called, or Karaites, that only follow the verses only. But again, how do they know what it means? We're going to go through a number of examples where we understand the Torah is, in and of itself is a law book. 
as a law book, it doesn't give me definitions. Now, if it doesn't give me definitions, how do I know what it means? And for the Karaites who are going to say, we're only going to accept what the what the what the Torah itself says. We're only going to accept what it says. Now, according to them, how do they know what things mean? So they're going to say it's based on our own interpretation. Thank you very much. So what makes their interpretation, you know, any better than what the rabbis say? They reject what the rabbis say. But it, but even if I would agree, just you know, we'll just throw this out there. You know, even if I would agree, they have the right to do that. They don't have to listen to the rabbis. What's the end result? The end result is they pretty much disappeared off the face of the map. That's the end result. So I would always say, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe in. Can you pass it down? And if you can't pass it down, you know, to the next generation, then seemingly it can't be true, right? Or it shouldn't be true. Now, someone will say, you know, you open up a can of worms there. Someone will say, well, look, you know, you got tens of thousands, millions of Christians and Muslims or whatever, you know, they're seemingly still around. You know, they seem to be able to, you know, pass it down, so to speak. So you're going to say, well, that's not such a real criteria. We know it's false. Eventually it's going to die out, right? Eventually, you know, we know it's false, you know, in many ways. You know, but here, you know, someone, you know, you can imagine, like, someone would attack me for no reason. And someone would say, come on, you can't say there are 5,000 Karaites in the world. Someone claimed there are 50,000. There are, like, 50,000 Karaites in the world. I don't know, 50,000. 50,000, okay, not such a, no, 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 not a huge number. I wouldn't say it's such a small number, but you, you don't hear about them. You don't hear about them too much. But in any case, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that. But in any case, if you go through history, you go throughout the Middle Ages, there were a significant amount of Karaites throughout the Middle East, some in Eastern Europe. But as we mentioned, their their numbers have totally diminished. They've, they've diminished to such a point where, again, we don't hear about them. We don't fathom them. Like, when's the last time you heard a Karai community anywhere did anything significant? You don't hear about it. 100% we don't hear about it. There might be, you know, a few of these remaining descendants of what we're going to call practicing Karai. Even if there's there's a remnant, you know, 100% that's all it is. It doesn't mean that much, right? Because it's seemingly insignificant. They're going to be small groups who don't come from Karai. But, you know, I've come in contact with quite a few of them. But they've embraced it because... You know, people that say, coming out of Christianity or, or, you know, wherever they come from, what are they going to say? They're going to say, okay, we know this to be false. And what's Christianity based on? It's based on the Torah, based on, quote, unquote, the Old Testament. So if it's based on the Old Testament, let's understand. Let's delve in deep and understand what the Old Testament says. Now, we said there's a problem. How am I going to understand what the verses mean if it's a law book? And if it's a law book, I don't have definition, so to speak. So you have people that are going to say, and I've heard this many, many times, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't need the rabbis, you know, etc. I'm going to figure it out on myself. God's going to tell me. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to do all these other things. And my answer always is, good luck. <laughs> you know, we'll see where you end up. But what is going to make their interpretation more legitimate and what the rabbis say. They say, we're going to listen and we're going to follow what the Torah verse says. It's going to be very, very hard to do because, again, we don't have definition. Now, comes along traditional Judaism, which we'll call orthodoxy, for lack of a better name. And they've refuted the claims based on logic, based on scriptural proof. See, if you're going to bring a proof and say, well, you know, the Rambam says like this, or the Gemara says like that, or the commentaries say like that, no, they're not going to listen. They're going to say, that's human interpretation. Why do I have to listen to them? So instead of saying, okay, I got this proof, I got that proof, go to pure logical proof, scriptural proof, right? You have Rafsadji Gon, who's got a lot of scriptural proof. You got the Rivet, who's commentary on the Rambam. You got Rabbi Yehuda Levi, who brings down in the Kuzari, the one who wrote the Kuzari, uh, et cetera. So we'll mention, you know, we'll mention a few of the arguments, you know, against them. Now, what are Karaites, what do they do? They reject 100% authoritative oral Torah explanation of the written Torah. They reject it 100%, which we say goes back to the knowledge God revealed to Moses of Mount Sinai. Now, let's, let's just, we'll stop there for a second. Let's understand, God takes the Jewish people out of Egypt. Brings them to Mount Sinai. Now, once he brings them to Mount Sinai, so God, as the Torah tells me, 
God gives over the Ten Commandments. He says to Moshe, the entire nation, let's say better, the entire nation hears either the first two of the Ten Commandments. They died because the experience was so great. They died. God brought them back to life. After the first two, some of the commentaries say they heard, you know, they said to Moshe, listen, it's too great an experience. You know, we can't handle it. You tell us what God said. You tell us what God said. Some say they heard all the Ten Commandments. Regardless, okay, so God gave the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people, right? He gives the Torah to the Jewish people, which nobody disagrees, right? Nobody disagrees. We, mentioned, we spoke about this last week. Nobody disagrees, not the Christians, not the Muslims. Right, everyone agrees God gave the Torah to us in front of two million people, three million people, which has never been duplicated. Never been duplicated. Now, that being the case, we could ask a very simple question: How long are the Jews in the desert for before they go into the they go before they go into the land of Israel? Jewish people are in the desert for forty years. Now, if they're in the desert for forty years, if you're going to tell me Moses only got the 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 written Torah, in other words, the Old Testament as we understand. So God spoke to Moshe and he gave them all the commandments. Now, how long, even if you're talking about two to three million people, how long would it take for Moses? And let's say he had a committee, you know, 100 people, 1,000 people, whatever. He gave it over to them and then they're going to pass it down to the Jewish people. And then they're going to go in different groups and pass it down to the entire Jewish nation. Now, how long would that take? 10 years, five years, 20 years. You have 613 commandments, right? So, you know, we, we could ask the question, you know, how long is that going to be? How how hard can it be to give down, to give over that information? I would think it's not that complicated. Again, you have to have a lot of chains. You have to have a lot of chains passing this down. But just giving over the information, it shouldn't take 40 years. You know, again, we're not talking about people necessarily having a genius IQ. They don't have to have a genius IQ. You know, you keep you rehashing the same thing. Don't steal. There's a command not to kill. You know, there, there's a command, um, you know, to keep Shabbos. There's a command to shoo away the mother bird, take the eggs. There's a command for this, command for that. You know, keep kosher, all these things. How long can it take? I just mentioned, you know, five or six. You know, if I, I speak fast enough, I'll mention 20, you know, 30, 50, 100. How long can it take in order to explain what they are? So to explain what they are, what the commandments are, shouldn't take that long. Certainly shouldn't take 40 years. I mean, unless, God forbid, you know, you got people that just can't fathom what it is and you have to keep going over and over and over, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times. That you know, you know, people are thick in the head. I could understand. Maybe. 40 years it's gonna take to give over 613 commands. You know, you go one day, okay, you go through a bunch, you review it, you do the next day. You review it, you go through some new ones. You go Again, you go through a pattern. There are ways to do this. It should never take 40 years. 40 years is, I would think, is absurd. Yeah, that's a huge amount of time, you know, if you think about it. So that being the case, what was Moshe doing after he got the Torah? And he's explaining to the Jewish people, right? The Torah says many times, God spoke to Moshe saying, God spoke to Aaron saying, many, many times, right? So if that's the case, He's telling you, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. What, what's the obvious question? If I was sitting there or anybody else was sitting there, the obvious question, the million and a half dollar question, as we always up the ante, the million and a half dollar question is, what does this mean? What does it mean don't kill? What about euthanasia? You know, is that murder? No, that's mercy. That's not murder. Come on, grandpa should have died a long time ago. He's a burden to us, burden to himself. Put him out of his misery. Or out of our misery, you know, that, does that apply? And what if someone's chasing me, trying to kill me, you end up killing them. Does that apply? You know, you killed in self-defense. You know, th there are a million questions that a person could ask, right? So what would what would uh, the people that Moshe trained, the elders and whoever that Moshe trained, he's going to say, no, just get to the facts. Let's just, let's just stay to the facts. But we got questions. We got a million questions over here. So the Karaites themselves, they're going to reject it. They're going to say, what did Moshe get at Mount Sinai? What Moshe got at Mount Sinai, they're going to say is, they're going to say what? He only got what God revealed. That's it. He only got the written law. That's it. He didn't get anything else. That they're going to reject. So the Torah verses alone, as we mentioned, are obtuse. You cannot possibly know what the Torah means, right? We just gave one example by Myrtle. Give other examples, right? In any verse, you know, I'm not even saying, you know, 
don't steal. We use don't steal as an example. How much? What if you were starving and the person had plenty of money? person was rich. So, you know, like Robin Hood, you, you took from the rich to give to the poor, right? You did it for yourself. You know, you're going through a hard time. You barely have any food. So they're not going to miss the money anyway. Is that stealing? That's survival. That's not stealing. They're not going to miss it anyway. So what, what's the big deal? Again, what does the Torah mean? In any verse, I'm just giving relatively easy examples. So if I don't have a divinely revealed, some sort of elucidation of what it means, i.e. what we're going to call oral law, then how do I know anything? Because the Torah itself is superficial, it's inadequate, it's subjective. And, and again, it's a law book. If it's a law book, it's not telling me how to do things. Now, the Karites, Karites go further. They make a claim that each person has the ability to interpret and practice the Torah according to their own understanding. Now, if it's their own understanding, isn't that subjective? Can it change according to time? I can't even tell you how many times, you know, I heard this when I was part of the conservative movement, you know, and I studied by them in New York, you know, and they would say all the time, the Torah changes with time. Now, what's the problem with that statement? The problem is, the Torah doesn't tell me that. The Torah tells me this forever. Now, certain things, certain things may not apply for different reasons. They may go by the wayside. But if we lived in a perfect world, they would stick. You know, it would stick. But we, if we do things that are egregious and now certain things don't work anymore, it goes by the wayside. You know, it, it, it gets thrown out over here. So according to them, they're going to say we have the ability to interpret and practice according to our own understanding. So what would be the obvious question? It won't make your interpretation any better. Who says you have you you know you have the direct line over here? Isn't that the isn't that the claim? You know, a lot of people make and they'll say, How do you know? How do you know? You know, you gotta claim this is the right way. Well, that's your interpretation. Can't even tell you how many times I heard that. Well, that's your interpretation. Okay, you got a better interpretation that works, that you can pass down, you know, to the next generation, even by reform and conservative. Right, we've spoken about that before. You know, even if I would say, Well, you have the right to change the Torah. The Torah is fickle. I can go with the times, so to speak. Okay, what's the end result? Assimilation into marriage. That's the end result. So if that's the end result, that doesn't work. Even if I would agree in theory, which I don't, but even if I would agree, it doesn't work. So the Karaites are gonna say that what are they doing? They're attaining objective divine will. How in the world can that be? Why? Because they're coming to something that is subjective. It's subjective human interpretation. There's no base. There's no anchor. Morality can be relative. It can change, right? The famous parable with the Dubna Magid. Dubna Magid tells a story and he, 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 tells a, he gives over a parable. He says the king is walking in the forest and the king sees arrows shot into trees and, and shot right in the middle of a bullseye. So he's like, wow, this is great. I gotta, you know, I gotta find this marksman. I gotta find, you know, I gotta find this marksman, tell him, you know, and have him train my men how to shoot. This is unbelievable. So he finds the marksman and he asks the marksman, can you give advice to my men? Tell them how to be, you know, an expert marksman like yourself. So he says, sure, it's very easy. He says, I take my bow and arrow, I shoot it in the air. And when it hits a tree, I draw a bullseye around it. So that bullseye, so to speak, is morality. Since it's morality, it changes. Why does it change? Because the times say what changes. Something that, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 80 years ago, would have been, un, you know, unheard of. Today becomes a mitzvah. Aye. So what, what mentality changed? Torah didn't change. The morality of Torah didn't change. But you see, the world's gone haywire. The world is trying to give a whole definition, you know, of what a human being is. What his sexual preference is. And all that. We'll keep this clean so you don't get banned on YouTube, right? So they're ramming it down everybody's throat. That's unheard of. You want to do it in your house, behind closed doors, one thing. You want to sit there and brag about it, you know, and put it as an agenda out there. Totally goes against what the Torah says, right? No question. No question. So what's going to happen is it's going to be subjective. It's going to be individualized. People are certainly not going to agree. I mean, unless you set up some sort of committee and you're going to have to set up a whole bunch of rules. In order to get everyone to agree, but I, you're not, you're not necessarily going to get everyone to agree, right? It's going to be individualized. People are going to do what they want. Their morality will be different, one person to another, be totally different. So, therefore, what are they going to say? As we mentioned, Torah changes according to time. Totally not true. They'll say it goes according to time, it changes, 
according to period, according to location, community. You know, every stage of life, it changes. It evolves, so to speak. Now, someone could, someone could ask the question and say, well, doesn't the Torah say, I'm not allowed to kindle a fire on Shabbat? Right? That's what the Torah says. Not allowed to kindle a fire on Shabbat. Now, there's an obvious question. What about electricity? Torah didn't mention anything about electricity. What you know? What about the microwave? What you know? You know? What about you know? Gas doesn't do the same thing. Torah doesn't tell me, right? So then they're going to say, "Oh, the rabbi said this." They're adding to the Torah. That's not adding to the Torah. The Torah doesn't give me a definition. The Torah doesn't tell me what it is, right? So now, so they're going to say, "Oh, so now you're going to say it changes according to time." A hot plague. You know, it, it, you know, is that the same thing as fire? Oh, you're changing the Torah. You know, it's, it's a change in, you know, time period. It's a change in the individual, the stage of life, all these things. And what's the answer? Totally not, because it's explaining what it is. You know, does it meet this criteria or does it meet this criteria? But if you're going to tell me it changes according to time, first of all, you got to bring me proof, right? And that, that that's the obvious thing. You got to bring proof why that is. And how that you know, and how that works. Yeah, but they're good. That's what they're going to claim. They're going to claim it changes. So that's one thing. Second thing is that Karaites are going to reject oral law. They're going to say, according to their own understanding, what Torah is. You know, according to what it means, etc. Right? They're going to say it's what I think. It's subjective, which undermines the Torah system of reward and punishment. In other words, one of the thirteen principles of Maimonides is the fact that every Jew has to believe there's reward and punishment. The Torah tells me in the second paragraph of the Shema, you do the right thing, God will give you rain. God will give you sustenance. You do the wrong thing, there's payback. And we see the Jewish people, a lot of payback, a lot of suffering. Just, you know, we just finished the nine days and the fast of the ninth of Oath, you know, destruction of the first temple, destruction of the second temple. I mean, a lot of catastrophe, a lot of catastrophe that have happened to Jewish people, you know, throughout the millennium. So what would happen with reward and punishment? If it's subjective, they undermine this whole thing. Why? Because if it doesn't have any fixed meaning or application, and we said before that Torah is extremely vague because it's a law book, if it's vague, so to speak, how in the world could you apply a promise for rewards or warn of punishment for going against Jewish beliefs and practices? That, that wouldn't make any sense because there could be multiple interpretations you know there could be many correct interpretations as people interpret it so what would i say based on that and this would be a major question for them and that is how is there any accountability how in the world can i say okay this person should be punished because they went against what the torah says in this case wait a minute but other people think that's okay right so if other people think it's okay you could get out of everything there'd be no accountability how is the person going to get rewarded <laughs> for some people they didn't do anything whatever this mitzvah is they didn't do it right, according to some. Others will say, no, you know, depends how you feel. <laughs> depends what you want. It depends on all kinds of other things. That wouldn't make any sense either, right? So in both cases, I don't have accountability where a person's going to get reward. I don't have accountability for punishment because the person could always score them out of it in many ways because people are going to say there are a lot of interpretations. So maybe my interpretation's right. And again, you know, some people will say, some people will say, okay, you're a minority, right? Orthodoxy is like 10%, let's say. You know, the Jewish people. What about everyone else? What do you think? The rest of the Jewish people, 90% who can't even read the Aleph base. 90% don't know Shema Yisrael. They don't know anything. And they're going to say, my opinion is just as valid. And I can do what I want. So I, you know, show me precedent. Show me where that's true. Show me that even if it were be, would be true, that it works. And if it doesn't work, no, no, that's just my interpretation. So what would happen? Let's just throw this out there. What would happen? Everyone decides to interpret the way they want. And, you know, the law of splinter groups, and these splinter groups eventually, they all die out. Doesn't the Torah tell me Jews are going to come to the promised land? This is what it's supposed to be. You know, there's an, there's an idea of the Messiah, blah, blah, blah. There's redemption. What's going to happen? There's going to be no Jews left. If there's no Jews left, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like, if you were to tell my parents' generation 80 years ago, 90 years ago, and you would say, you know, what's going to be? Judaism might not survive. They get shaken up a little bit because they still had that feeling of what Torah is, you know, from their parents or their grandparents. Today's generation, they'll say, all right, so it didn't work. It was a nice try. We got killed all over the place. You know, it wasn't meant to be forever, and that's it. But that's not what the Torah says. You know, many times as I work my way, 
you know, through the Torah, we're holding by the book of Leviticus chapter 16, right? I get this class every Sunday, 9 o'clock Eastern time. Anyone interested? So I've been working my way through. And every time I come to a verse where God says that this is going to be forever, I emphasize this point, usually. Forever doesn't mean I, f I do whatever I feel like. I, you know, I go according to the time, according to the location. Forever means forever. Now, forever means forever. Some things we mention may go by the wayside because now they might not apply for different reasons. That doesn't mean the Torah is not true. That just means we messed it up, right? So in this case, you know, people could say, well, there are a lot of interpretations. Great. There are a lot of good things going on or bad things. How in the world am I ever going to be held accountable? There's no accountability, right? That, that's a major problem. It's the third problem over here. The third problem is, if I don't have a divinely revealed oral law, oral Torah to, com to complement over here, because the Torah is a law book, Torah doesn't give me any details over here. So observance itself is also keeping what the Torah says as a non-starter. Why? Why would I say it's a non-starter? Because there's no mitzvah in the Torah that can be practiced according to in the Torah, the way its description is, right? Give one example. Maybe we'll give a few examples. One example, take the fill-in. What is the what does it say by phylactery? I don't know what phylacteries are. That's what they that's the English translation of tefillin. Tefillin, it says, these words shall be bound upon your arm and assigned between your eyes. Right? To be frontlets. I don't know what frontlets are. <laughs> they should be assigned between your eyes. Now, what, what's the obvious question or questions? Where are the details? How do I write them? How do I make them? What do I write them on? What do I bind them with? I mean, imagine we had to bind them with staples. That'd be kind of painful. How do we bind them? What do we do? What shape? What color? What material? Which arm? Maybe, you know, maybe it's on the left arm. Maybe it's on the right arm. What if a person doesn't have an arm? What if, they, you know, what if their hand got cut off? What, you know, what, what do they do then? The answer. Torah says you got to put it, you put these things between your eyes. Okay. You know, where? Does it mean right here? Does it mean up here? Does it mean to the side? Does it tell me? Right? What's missing in the command is all the detail. So, therefore, come on the oral tour. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do without it. Right? Another example will say, the tour says, Leviticus chapter 24, sitting in the sukkah. And, you know, the holiday of sukkahs. And I have to bring, I have to bring palm fronds, willows, myrtle leaves. Tour tells me a nice smelling fruit. Okay. You think it's a quince. Someone thinks it's a pomegranate. Someone thinks it's a pineapple. Someone thinks it's, I don't know, something else. It's a star fruit. Who knows what? It says you're going to bring it in front of God. Where? When? All right. When? The, the Torah tells me the date. Okay. But even so, how do I know what this nice smelling fruit is? And what, what if I get it wrong? You bring a quint. Let's say it's wrong. Right? Well, we know it's wrong because it's it's a it's an S rope. Right? Or, or a citron. I don't know how you're going to, how you're going to, you know, whatever you're going to call it in English, it's a nest rogue, right? No one's going to think this nice smelling fruit is a lemon on steroids. That's the way it looks. You're going to tell, you know, someone's going to say, come on, a quince is much nicer. Pomegranate's much nicer. You're going to tell me it's this? Or if I don't get it right, what are the laws of Shabbos? Same thing, right? God says, if you don't get it right, you get killed and you get, you get spiritually cut off. Don't give me any definition. It tells me three things. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to kindle a fire. You're not allowed to carry but it doesn't give me any definitions of these things. It just tells me you're not allowed to do it. So the Torah tells me many, many times. Just about the whole thing. It tells me things, no detail. So how in the world are you going to know? How are you going to know what to do? Tefillin's a good example. You know, it's also a good example. What shape? What color? What does it mean between my eyes? What does it mean put it on my arm? What does it mean, sorry, what does it mean to bind them? Right? No definition. Now, what, what are the Karaites going to say? Karaites are going to say, come on. There are other cryptic commands. Other commands don't make any sense. But but what are they? See, they're going to come and say they're metaphorical. It's a metaphor. Well, can't we say that about many, many other mitzvahs? They're just as cryptic. What about, what about ritual slaughter? Shechita, as it's known. Or other kosher laws, which Karaites, in fact, keep. So if they keep kosher, we're not told anything. It just says don't cook a calf in its mother's milk. So, you know so for a Karite, I would ask them the question, very good. So we don't mix milk and meat. What about, does that mean if they're cold? What if they're cold? Can I mix them? If they're hot, can I mix them? No definition, right? But in this case, they keep kosher laws. They keep the laws of ritual slaughter. So if they keep the, if they keep the laws of ritual slaughter, aren't these, aren't these things cryptic? They're extremely cryptic. They don't tell me anything. They don't tell me how to do it. They don't give me any definition, nothing. 
but they do keep it. You know, and also the Torah itself, when it comes to the laws of ritual slaughter, doesn't tell me how an animal should be killed, that I, I'd be allowed to eat it. do not tell me anything. Not only that, it only says a Jew could do it, right? It's only a Jew could do so. But what about forbidden parts of the animal? You know, a non-Jew, could they, they could remove it, right? Technically speaking. But again, you want to eat it? You want to eat it? How do I kill it? Is an animal the same as a bird? Maybe there's a different way to slaughter a bird. What about fish? You know, do I have to slaughter a fish the same way? You're going to say, come on, they're, you, know, you, you take them out of the water. Uh, you know, how can I do it the same way? They're squirmy, this, that. Doesn't matter. Is there a definition? Don't run and tell me. Don't run and tell me anything. So what do the Karaites do? See, this is the problem also, you know, with Messianics as well. And what are they? Oh, we don't listen to the rabbis. We don't listen to them. But what, but the reality is if they keep kosher and they hold by by ritual slaughter, that means they hold according to oral law. What does it mean in general? They pick and choose. So according to them, if they're going to hold according to the laws of ritual slaughter or other kosher laws, they have to listen to oral law. They don't have a choice. And that would be with any other law. Again, there's a total contradiction. If you're going to keep these laws that are very cryptic and the only way to keep them is to do what the rabbis tell you to do and how to practice them, then you can't say, I don't hold according to the rabbi, right? So either you're going to tell me the Karaites should either use no oral law or they're going to have to rely in some cases on oral law. They have no choice, right? So they should rely on oral law for everything, right? So it's it's, it's either way. Either you tell me I don't have anything to do with oral law or I rely on it 100%. See, the Messianics we mentioned, they're going to come across and say, we don't listen to the rabbis. We never listen to the rabbis. Now, that's not true. And a very simple proof for that is, how do you have a King James King James version of, of the Bible? How do you have that translation? Because if you go according to the Masoretic text, the Masoretic text has vowels. The rabbis put in the vowels. Because if you look at a Torah scroll in general, Torah scroll doesn't have vowels. So how do you know what the words mean? How do you know how to pronounce the words? You would have no way to, to know how to pronounce the words. Ah. Oh, Come on, the rabbis, they put in the vowels. So if you're going to be intellectually honest, which a lot of these people are not, but, you know, I'm not going to give them the benefit of the doubt because they're not intellectually honest. So just admit you pick and choose. See, if you admit it, you know, you pick and choose, I'm not going to hammer you over here, right? I'll be very easygoing. We're going to have a problem. But if you're going to pick and choose, admit you pick and choose. So the Karaites, in this case, should either go one way or the other. Either they're going to use the oral law 100% because they have no choice, or they're never going to use it. So how are they going to keep the laws of ritual slaughter or other kosher laws or other things that they're going to do, you know, if they don't hold by oral law? Check, mate. It's easy. You hold by it or you don't. You can't, you can't have it both ways. What are these Karite scholars, what are they going to answer, you know, against us and say we have a right to do this and all that? They're going to claim it's authentic, it's original Judaism, but obviously they don't compare certainly to the strength of Talmudic scholars, right? Their arguments, totally weak, flawed. And not only that, but if you look at some of the Karite communities, they don't differ in many ways, you know, from us, from quote unquote, the traditional community. Therefore, they were much more integrated in the Jewish community. Now, so if that's if that's the case, okay, they veered off. They, def they definitely veered off, no question, right? But if they were somewhat traditional, it's only because they were part of the community. Now, some opinions are going to say that, you know, Karaites, you know, are Jewish. You know, they, they, you know, they are Jewish. But what's the problem? What's the problem? problem is that Karaites define Jewishness through patrilineal descent. They go through the father, not the mother. And they're going to have a different standard for conversion. And they probably haven't kept the laws of divorce properly, which is probably true. So there's going to be all kinds of problems. Illegitimate children, right? You have to give a bill of divorce. Right, what we call a get. They have, you know, they have all kinds of different, you know, standards over here. Well, let's get back to the original point here. You know, and that is, you know, if they're going to claim Jewishness goes through patrilineal descent. Now, we do understand if a person comes from a certain tribe, that goes according to the father, not the mother. We do on now. We do understand as well that for us and the reform and conservative movement have taken this on. That to say who the if the child is Jewish. Even if one parent is Jewish, that's good enough. doesn't have to go through the mother. One reason could be, let's say, you know, why do you go through the mother? Because you don't always know who the father is. You can tell me, I, you know, when it comes to DNA, you can do a DNA test. Good. Yeah, but it's not always going to be clear. You know, not always going to be clear over here. 
who the father is. Now, today might be a different story, right, in general. We know who the mother is, right? That, that's clear. So they're going to have different definitions, different definitions of things that are crucial to Judaism. Conversion, right? Carrie's going to agree a non-Jew can convert, right? They're allowed to convert. It's a question of what a non-Jews ask. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not allowed to convert. Maybe I'm not allowed to go through this, right? Maybe it's only if you're a born Jew, but that's a mistake. That's a big mistake. We can certainly go through conversion if it's done right. But they're going to have different standards of what conversion is. They certainly, as we mentioned, it's going to be a huge problem, you know, and that is, what about the laws of marriage and divorce? That, you know, and that's one of the major problems with Ethiopian Jews today, that certain things, marriage, divorce, or they have Jewish tradition on that. So if you say that they're Jewish and they don't need to go through conversion, so you're going to have a lot of children that are born that are considered mumzerim. They're considered children that never should have never should have been born, right? They're forbidden relationships. So that's going to be a serious thing. So if you say they're Jewish, you've got all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems you bring them into the Jewish people. So you say, okay, you know, you had certain traditions. A lot of traditions you didn't have. So if you didn't have them, you should go through conversion. If you don't go through conversion, you open up a whole Pandora's box. You open up a huge thing. Huge thing. It's going to be problematic across the board. So conversion is going to have different standards. Divorce, you're going to have, you know, they didn't keep the laws of divorce either properly. So there's going to be major concern whether Karaites are Jewish or not. And that's going to be, you know, even if a person, even if a person wanted to marry a Karaite, this Karaite could be a Mamzer, right? A Mamzer is someone who can only marry someone of the same union or a convert. So therefore, even if they fell in love and all this and everything's good, they can't marry can't marry a regular Jew, you know, in, in, in many ways. They can't. It's an impossibility. So you're setting up all kinds of problems for that. So the standards are way off. But, it, you know, but again, you know, the, the question becomes, they're going to have to interpret the way, however they're going to do it. And that's going to cause a lot of problems because that's subjective, right? That, that's one issue. You know, but at the same time, we got a more basic issue. You're going to tell me, okay, you know, it's interpretation. The, the you know, the Torah is very vague. How do they, you know, how are they going to interpret it? Blah, blah, blah. They, you know, we understand. We understand they hold by certain things. They keep kosher. They keep, you know, ritual slaughter and all that. So you can't, so it's either I hold by the whole thing or I don't hold by any of it, right? But there's a more basic question. How do I know they're Jews, right? Reformed Jews, conservative Jews will say against Orthodox Jews, they'll say, you don't even think I'm Jewish. If your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. Now, you can do things, you know, desecrate Shabbos in public, do other things that you could technically lose your status of being a Jew, but obviously, you know, gain it back if you, you know, obviously through proper repentance and all that. But we're not saying someone's not Jewish unless there is problems. If the mother isn't Jewish, that's a problem. But we're not just saying, well, all Reformed Jews aren't Jews. Not true. They they might be misguided, tremendously misguided. I don't think there's any question about that, right? Not only it doesn't work, you know, you know, but you're going to have a problem you know, with lineage, if if the if the person if the mother's not Jewish, or there was a conversion, you know, that went on somewhere in the family, and the conversion wasn't proper. You know, they didn't take on mitzvah when you know when they converted. They converted from marriage. Well, that's a big problem. Can't convert from marriage. Hundred percent, you can't convert from marriage. You can't convert for any out. You can't have any ulterior motive. It has to be because God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, and because you know non-Jews rejected it. I have to go through conversion. Fine, but you have to do it in a proper way. If you don't do it in a proper way, any of these things, you don't do it in a proper way, you're making a, you know, what I would say, a travesty of a mockery of a sham of what the Torah is. That's what you're doing. And you're going to make it up as you go along. That's a huge problem. So, you know, so in the end, what do I have? They're going to claim the rabbis this, the rabbis that, you know, etc. But they are subjecting themselves, their minds, their times, etc. And they're going to put all that into the Torah. And they're going to explain, however they explain, this, that, and the other thing, how it applies, doesn't apply, should keep it, shouldn't keep it. That is a recipe for disaster. So they're going to have to have a system that's set up in a whole committee, and everyone's going to have to agree they have the right to make these claims. In other words, the Torah says like this, so it says don't murder, but we don't hold abortions murder. We don't hold abortions murder because we're only going to hold when the fetus comes up, right, when the baby's born. You know, otherwise, it's not a living entity. Totally not a living entity. I mean, kind of hard to say. Six months, you can see. You know, but they'll say, okay. You know, they're going to have to say, they're going to have to come down with all kinds of laws and interpretations of many, many different things and say, okay, this is what we hold. 
right? But that's going to be, you know, they're going to have to set up this, this committee, this law committee to do such a thing. But the question is, is that going to be good enough for everyone else? So, you know, there is a law committee, quote unquote, um, you know, by the conservative movement, probably by the reform movement also. But interesting enough, even if there's a law committee and they say on the books, this we allow, this we don't allow, blah, blah, blah. What about individual rabbis? Right? In other words, I'll give one example. Um, we hold, the Orthodox hold, you're not allowed to drive synagogue on Shabbos. All right, a lot of different reasons, not the point for now. Oh, you're not allowed to drive synagogue on Shabbos. E- even if, you know, in the conservative movement, when they discussed this, you know, they said, okay, you know, if you want to drive to synagogue on Shabbos, fine. You're only allowed to drive to synagogue, you're not allowed to go anywhere else. So that's on the books. Now, if you're a staunch conservative Jew, that's what you should do. But then if that's going to trickle down, what about the rabbi of your synagogue? Say, nah, don't worry about it. You can drive anywhere else. I don't hold that way. It's going to be a hodgepodge, and that's what it is. In the conservative movement, the reform movement, it's a hodgepodge. Some do more, some do less. They do whatever they feel like doing. That's not what Jewish law is. So you're going to say, well, what about you know the Orthodox community? you got all kinds of different communities. you got Ashkenazic, you got Sephardic. You know, you have Chabad, yeah, you know, you have a lot of different, a lot of different types of communities, yeah, but 99%, we all agree in. Okay, there are certain things, certain customs that, that Sephardic people have that we don't do, and whatever, Not again, not the purpose for now, but that's not the same thing. That we believe in the main, you know, in the, in the, the main things that, that, that Judaism is all about. We agree in all the tenets. Here, they're doing whatever they want. You know, they're making it like an ownerless world. You know, they feel like doing it, they don't feel like doing it, but it's, you know, whatever the quote-unquote law assembly, whatever you want to call it, is going to say, these are these laws are on the book, and it doesn't trickle down. Or the rabbi of the synagogue is going to say, I agree, I don't agree. What gives him the right? Either you hold by it or you don't hold by it. You don't hold by it, so then what do you have the law court there for? What do you have the rabbinic assembly, as it's called? What do you have it for? No, we have to make decisions, we have to, yeah. But your constituents don't hold of it. So what's going to happen over here? How in the world is that going to be any different? So you're going to say, okay, they're not interested in changing things. They're not going that far. What are they doing? They're saying, we have a right to interpret the Torah as the Torah should be interpreted. We're not going to look at oral law. We're not going to look at anything else. Okay, but how is that any different? You know, than the rabbinic assembly, than whatever reform does. There's no difference. Because they're not going to trickle down. Because people are going to do whatever they want. And how are you going to reinforce it? How are there going to be any implications for any wrongdoing or for any good doing, right? Let's say people actually do the right thing. There's going to be no accountability, right? That's one of the Rambam's, the, the first of the Rambam's 13 principles, right? The Rambam says that God is absolute, that God doesn't change, that God is not fickle because if they, if God was fickle, then again, morality is relative. If, if morality is relative, it changes. If it changes, it's a disaster. Right, hundred percent. You know, it's you know, it's a disaster over here. It's a total disaster. So I would say, even based on that, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, if you want to tell me I have the right to do this, and I have my proofs, and I can do whatever I want, and blah blah blah, my question would be, does it work? Now you're gonna say ten percent of the Jewish people are Orthodox. Fine. Up until two hundred fifty years ago, everybody was more or less. So things have changed in the last two hundred fifty years. Fine. But at, but at the same time, what do I have over here? You know, if I have 10% of the Jewish people, let's say more than a million people, a million people keeping Torah mitzvahs at some level in the right way. Here at best, and again, I still think it's a high number, but even if you tell me there are 50,000 Karaites, you know, 50,000 Karaites, you know, in the in the world, that means they pretty much disappeared. You can't say I have the right to interpret whatever, so pass it down. Show me it works. If it doesn't work, you're reformed, conservative, I don't care. I don't care what you want to label yourself as. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? That, 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 that's what I would say. That's it, you know. Some people say it doesn't have to work. That, you know, it was a good try. Jesus doesn't have to be forever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're going to, you know, then we have to go through specific verses and what it means and how you're going to look at it. Fine, but it's a disaster. Some places, you know, someone will claim they're more traditional, they're less traditional. It doesn't matter. The end result is it doesn't work. Right. And the Torah has to work. The Torah has to be passed down. Right. Right. And, you know, it's so watered down, you know, in you know, in so many ways. So they do what they want. But see, if it trickles down and the rabbis themselves do what they want. I'll give one example. My wife was becoming religious and she went to a conservative synagogue. So she asked the rabbi of the synagogue, are you allowed to ride a bike on Shabbos? 
What was his answer? His answer was, you want to know what I do? He's like, no, I want to know. What according to Jewish law? Am I allowed to ride a bike or not? And his answer was, I ride a bike on Shabbos. Now, we would call that a third and long. That's called a punt. That's not an answer. You want to know what I do? Well, I care what you do. I'm not interested in what you do. But that was his answer. You know, any conservative synagogues really keep Shabbos the way it should? They have no idea. None. None whatsoever. You tell me there is some place that might be more traditional. Okay? I could be here till tomorrow and, and, you know, and just list a number of things I guarantee they don't keep in the laws of Shabbos. They wouldn't know because they don't learn it. They don't learn the sources. How would they know? So it doesn't work, right? If it doesn't work, you know, pack up Shabbos. But that's what we do, okay? You know, people can say what they want. They can do what they want. At the end of the day, the bottom line is, if you don't look like someone like me, or, you know, huh. you know you're going to hold the court, you're going to hold the court what the Torah says, you will disappear. You will be a fossil. You'll be a fossil. I've heard people say, nah, synagogue's never going to die. Never going to this. They're all dying. All these reformed conservative synagogues. All these big buildings being sold. Because you can't pass it down. So, you know, Karaites, again, if there are a million Jews that keep some form of Torah mitzvahs in the right way, a million Okay, it's ten percent. Let's say carry the fifty thousand. That's not even that's not even quarter percent over here. Really? Quarter percent. So they want to fight. You know, gotta say the rabbis took too much power. They did other things. They scrutinized us. They whatever. Okay, but why did they die out? They died out because it doesn't work, and it doesn't make sense. And you know, for a lot of the reasons that um, you know, you know that we mentioned. And if you're gonna say, well, maybe some families did it right. Maybe so. Maybe they would have passed it down. Very good. But but again. You're talking about such a small percentage. Such a small percentage, they're, they're irrelevant. You can say what you want against the Orthodox. The Orthodox are thriving in many ways. Many ways, right? We are the future. There's nothing else. Uh, did you discuss the, the origin, How what, what created them? We, we understand, we understand that Tom tells us that it started with, it started with these, you know, these okay. two people and their that's followers. You know, that, that, that's, that's pretty much where it started. You can see how far that goes and what. Sure. You know, you know, and and you know what gets passed down or doesn't get passed down. It makes a whole crazy, you know, crazy movement out of it. But you, you see that they totally died out. Right. You know, pretty much. Okay, well, awesome. Well, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, see some new members up there on, in the YouTube land. Awesome. If you guys uh, who are not in chat want to join in the chat, just uh, click the, click the actual join button on the YouTube channel. So, uh, Rabbi, have a great week, and we'll see you same time, same place next week. Hashem willing, and uh, all you uh, folks, that was uh, it was it was a good week. So we'll see you soon. Take care, Rabbi. Thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next time. Shalom, my dear friends, followers, and supporters of Tanakh Talk. I would like for you, if you find this channel helpful in any way, and if it has benefited you, please consider supporting Tanakh Talk on a monthly basis. For the first time in eight years, Baruch Hashem, I am now working Tanakh Talk full-time. So having your consistent support is more important now than ever before. The long-term benefits will be excellent. I am finally able to invest the time and energy into the channel that I had intended on in the very beginning, bringing on more shows with more varieties of teachers and more types of classes. The ultimate goal will be to have 12 to 15 shows per week, plus a lot more. Now this is going to take some time, of course, but this is the direction that the channel is certainly headed. Also, I'm having a new website built by donors that's going to be more interactive and useful for everyone. Up until now, YouTube has been my only go-to for most everything to knock talk related, with the exception of the donate button. The new website will completely override the entire website with a slightly different branding curve as well. Same to knock talk, correct spelling. Praise Hashem, with this new website build, the resources will be much easier to locate and utilize. It will also allow me to send out bulk update emails on a fairly regular basis. There's much more to say, but in an effort to keep this video as short as possible, I will end with this. Many of you have been donating for a very long time. Some of you are new. Some of you have been with me since the beginning. That has been very key in keeping this program running for so long. So with all my heart and all my family's heart, thank you so much for your steady support. This is merely the beginning of a long journey, however, and I would be honored to have you all join me along the way. Shalom with lots of love from Tanakh Talk and the Hall family. If you are planning on starting to donate now, just simply go to PayPal and just search for Tanakh Talk by using the email address, tanakhtalk at gmail.com. 
Patreon is similar, but you can type it in the URL, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tanog Talk. Thank you again very much for your consideration.